Everybody will um, take their seats. Um, and we'll get this going. Let's get our mugs off there. We'll see about this. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the community conversation on the timing of elections sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Boulder County. My name is Jeanette Hillary and I am a proud member of the League and I'm pleased to serve as the facilitator and moderator for tonight's event. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization founded in 1920 to help some women, white women, exercise their newly won right to vote. For more than 90 years, League members have worked here in Boulder County to encourage informed and active participation in government and influence public policy through education and advocacy. We support the rights of all people to engage in political processes and work to make democracy work for everyone. To remain nonpartisan, the League never supports or opposes political candidates or parties. Each election season, our league, local league ballot issues team researches, prepares material for, and publicly presents analysis on the pro and con perspectives of each ballot question or issue before voters in Boulder County. We do not typically hold debates or forums on ballot issues. However, we are also beginning a study process to consider an organizational position on the timing of municipal and special district elections. The purpose of this community conversation is to inform the City of Boulder voters on the ballot issue, which is ballot issue 2E, and I will read that in a second. Our goal for the community conversation is a respectful dialogue in which people can hear from and learn about different perspectives about the timing of elections ask questions, and gain insight about this important issue. We expect that while participants may disagree, that they refrain from any personal insults or attack. Please also respect our timer, who is up front. Um, joining us this evening are um, Matt Benjamin, uh, who is for People for Voter Turnout. He is currently a member of the Boulder City Council, and he's lived in Boulder for t over 20 years and lives in South Boulder with his family. He started his time in Boulder studying astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Colorado. Um, he has led our mayor, our choice ballot measure that with nearly 80% of Boulder voters support now allows Boulder residents to elect our mayor using ranked choice voting. Um, and then on the opposing side is, um, and that's called Save Local Elections, is Sam Weaver, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cool Energy, as well as being the former mayor of Boulder. Um, he served on the city council for eight years, uh, including the mayor from 2019 to 2021. Um, he is currently serving on the board of Proton Power, a biomass fuel system company with, whose core technology extends to advanced materials and electric power generation using waste biomass. And with him um, is Dr. Brooke Harrison, who is the director of product for a competitive intelligence firm in oncology. Um, she has brought this experience uh, to the Boulder County Board of Health as a member since 2020. She, in addition, she serves on the Boulder Police Community Dialogue and Engagement Panel. After volunteering in the 2021 Boulder City Council elections, it became apparent how vital robust engagement is around local issues as well as where gaps exist in our current approaches to voter outreach. So I'm really very pleased to have our very well-informed uh, panelists this evening who are uh, going to be discussing Boulder Ballot Question 2E, Change Regular Municipal Election to Even Years. And it reads, and this is how it's going to show up on your ballot. Um, 
shall sections 5, 14, and 22 of the Boulder Home Rule Charter be amended to change the regular municipal election date to even-numbered years on the same date as the state general election, beginning with the November 2026 election date, and to implement the transition, reduce the term of the council members elected in 2023 and 2025 to three years and to increase the term of the mayor elected in 2023 to three years, all as more specifically provided in Ordinance 8546. Um, I'm going to start, uh, we had a toy toss, toss, and um, obviously Matt is going to start as the pro uh, on why he is for 2E, and uh, we, each group will have five minutes, and then we will take questions from the audience. We do have uh, questions that can be submitted to Liz, and she will collect them and give them to me, and um, I can go over them and read them out loud, and we give equal time to both parties. Um, so, Matt, you are on for your five-minute five minute introduction. That one's not working so well. I thought we had two plus of one. I think we just found this, but I'll go here for redundancy. Keep it simple. It's looking good. Well, welcome. My name is Matt Benjamin. Um, as mentioned, I'm a member of uh, Boulder City Council, and, and I've been very active in election reform and improving voter turnout and greater engagement in our electorate really since the moment I got started in, in local politics here um, in our city. Um, so I'm representing people for voter turnout. Um, I'll say the slogan once and I'll say it again, it's easy to vote yes on 2E. But I thought I'd start with sort of a shared vision, shared vision that was stated very eloquently by our former First Lady Michelle Obama. When we all vote, we get new ideas and new energy. We get leaders who share our values and listen to our voices. That's how we change America. Boulder's off-cycle elections are inherently the problem. And that is why when we led the Our Mayor, Our Choice campaign in 2020, it was to start to break down those intrinsic biases and the limitations that our current election system has. And it's not just the election system, but it's also when we elect people and who is left out of that process. As you can see here, one of the things that's the easy giveaway is just simply looking at the voter data that you all have access to, we all have access to. And when we start to look at a comparison, it jumps out at you. It is just a giant red flag that says, wait a minute, we are only engaging a small fraction of our electorate in odd years. This is a very engaged community, but even in a community like ours in Boulder, there are still people who do not participate in even year elections. And these gaps are pretty consistent. As you can see in 2020, we had 90% voter turnout, whereas compared to last year's council election, which I was a part of, and I, 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 maybe my, my hubris gets in the way, I thought that our candidates would be so great that we would drive voter turnout. That wasn't the case. Only about 49% of voters turned out in 2021. But it's not just how many people are left out, it's who is left out. And this is an issue of equity. The who is almost certainly, when you look at the data, are BIPOC communities. And for a community that is committed to a strong set of values for increasing diversity and equity in our community and inclusion, when we see that our very inherent election system is leaving out those that we are desperately trying to include in our election process, in our civic process, in our elections, in council, in our legislative functions, that means we're not doing it right. We're missing the mark. And you can see here of these 10 voter precincts, the voter drop off when you have communities of color. That is not the case when you look at precincts that are predominantly white. They almost vote exactly the same as even year to odd. 
There just isn't the voter drop off from even to odd. But voters off your elections are inherently just less diverse, right? If you look at the most racially diverse uh, precincts, you can see that in 2020, 86% voter turnout as compared to 30 in odd years. The least racially diverse precincts, you can see that that gap is much smaller. So we indeed have a racial disparity built into the very system we have here. So who else is left out? Young people. And, and some might say, well, this is just college students. It's actually not true. It's people under the age of 40. It's people who are working, who are families, who are simply perhaps just not in the place to vote on every election cycle. So we're missing out. We're missing out that next generation. 63% of voters who are left out of Boulder's off-year elections are under the age of 40. That's quite telling. Again, we are looking for greater engagement, and we're not seeing it. Elections belong to the people. But we can make democracy work for everyone. Council, um, a majority of our current city council, sorry, oh, is in support of this measure. Um, we, we have the, uh, Representative Judy Amable endorses this. And Boulder's not alone. Um, we'll just skip to this one here because we're about a minute left. Um, but when we look at other communities that have done this, they are seeing dramatic increases in voter turnout, and they are clearly being done in popular fashion when voted. But I want to leave you with the League of Women's uh, Voters mission, Empowering Voters, Defending Democracy. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters, defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. If there's a measure that can meet those values, it's voting yes on 2E to move our elections to even year. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I think you can all hear me if I raise my voice. Um, now we're going to go to the uh, anti side. And are you going to be the one to speak for first, Sam? Yeah, I'll speak first. Sam Weaver. you all hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Sam Weaver, and I'm here with Brooke Harrison. Uh, you've heard my introduction. I'm here for Save Local Elections to tell you about all the problems that the pro campaign does not tell you about, because I think those problems are huge, and there's no reason to rush into something that's not fully baked. So some of the major problems with 2E as it stands now is a move of council elections to even years will divide attention between the candidates and issues that are on the ballot now, as well as for donors and volunteers. It moves the elections but leaves Boulder Valley School District elections in the odd years, which will almost certainly reduce turnout for BBSD elections. And it's not needed in the sense that we have really low ballot access barriers here in Colorado because we have vote by mail, we have same day voter registration. So everyone is getting a ballot every year in their mailbox, and so all you need to do is fill the ballot out and return it. So if we want to increase participation, I think we need to do better outreach. So this year, every Colorado voter <clears throat> and every Boulder voter will face a ballot that has 40 choices, 40 different races on it. And within those races, there are at least two sides or two candidates. So we've got 80 different choices that we're choosing between in 40 different contests. 18 of these are candidate elections this year, and those are big candidate elections, obviously state, county, and federal, but you're gonna have 22 ballot items in front of you. And even years are typically when people try and do state level ballot items, 
So then now you've got 40 choices, we're gonna add, sorry, 80 choices, 40 issues, we're gonna add 15 more to that. That is obviously going to increase voter stress and it's gonna increase ballot drop off, which Brooke will address later when we get to questions about that. BPSD school district elections are held in odd years because that's what it says in the state <coughs> regs. And so if we were to vote yes on 2E, which I say don't do, vote no on 2E, if you voted yes, then the city council elections will be held in those even years, but BBSD elections will be held in odd years. And we can expect that if the attraction of council races moves, that it's likely that we're gonna have less people voting and there was, there was very little interaction, if any, publicly, between the city council and BBSD about this change. So I'm gonna quote one of our endorsers here, Kathy Gebhardt, <clears throat> and I'll read it to you because I think it's important to hear. Systemic change works best when all the interested parties are engaged and, have, and can have thorough and fact-based discussions, a process that did not occur here. So. I'll tell you on my next slides, <laughs> I'm gonna go to this one because I like showing our local elected officials and what they have to say. Another thing that our county clerk had to say about this is that one of the things you should do is engage in a robust stakeholder process to take a look at what are the impacts of a change like this going to be. I thought that was great advice. It was given to the city council in June of 2022. And instead of following that great advice, and its own <coughs> um, guidelines about public outreach, it had one public hearing on this. So it was introduced at first reading, second reading is when uh, people could weigh in, that's August 11th. So the, the only chance for public input, which apparently didn't include BBSD, was August 11th of 2022, and it came on the ballot finally September 1st of 2022. So it is not a very well-baked measure. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to stop here because I'd rather hear your questions than go on about it. But ultimately, the three main things that happen here that are bad, if we vote yes on 2E, are that it splits voter focus both on the ballot itself and then donors and volunteers have to choose national and state candidates to support or local candidates. Ballot fatigue is clearly going to be an issue with this shift and it deserves a much more robust community process. When I was on council, we developed a public outreach process for council initiated projects, which this one certainly was, which was about 18 months of outreach. And step three of the 12 steps that you're supposed to take with that is to make a public outreach plan. So with that, I would say, please vote no on 2E, and I think Brooke and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have a number of questions, and um, I would like, obviously, each group to um, answer this. How would you address the drop-off between presidential election years and the off-cycle gubernatorial even-year elections? Um, you know, this could be an issue because council terms are uh, four years, except for the fifth person, which is two years, but that's a separate issue. Okay, so... How would you address the drop-off between presidential election years and the off-cycle gubernatorial even-year elections? And um, Matt, why don't you start, and we'll give you, is three minutes good? Would you be able to do that? Yeah. Go for it. So thank you for the question. Um, you know, really trying to answer this, the, the, what I'm, the discrepancy between presidential and non-presidential even year elections. Um, there, to be frank, there isn't much of a discrepancy. So when you look at voter turnout, and I have a, a slide here that will show that. Is this right here? This is voter turnout for exactly what that question is meant to ask and address this. In 2020, a presidential election, we had 90% turnout. Two years prior, prior non-presidential, a gubernatorial race, effectively, or even, or what we'd consider sort of a non-presidential, was 83%. So we're talking 7%. So that drop-off is largely insignificant, but not entirely unexpected, given that 
you've got presidential money, presidential race, presidential advocacy drawing increased voter turnout. What I will say is perhaps a more important question is what about the voter turnout? What is that difference? When you see the orange bar there between our council elections and that of either non-presidential even year or presidential even year, we're talking about roughly 20,000 voters. And we know this because when we look at local issues, things like the Muni, things like our mayor choice, no eviction without representation, 300, 301, the sugary beverage tax. When we look at all of those initiatives and ballot measures that have been on our ballot, they are all getting roughly 50 to 55,000 people voted. Well, when we look at our, and we see those even in council years. And so we, and, and so what we're recognizing is local people still vote. They still vote on these local issues. They're just not in a position, because they're not on the ballot, to vote for council candidates. So we have 20,000 people who are ready and engaged and are working to vote and listen about the issues on important ones. If we trust these voters to vote on important, complex issues like CU South, like sugary beverage tax, things that are complex, that have impacts, shouldn't we also trust them to elect our council candidates? And, and I'll also add about sort of what's driving voter turnout. It's these ballot measures that's driving voter turnout, not the council elections. I wish, again, with a little hubris, that candidates aren't driving the turnout. It's the ballot measures. If we remember in 2017, it was municipalization that drove voter turnout. It wasn't any particular candidate or candidate groups. So even though candidates may leave the odd year elections, it's those measures that is still going to continue to drive voter turnout. And so it's not likely we're going to see much drop off at all for BVSD in that capacity. We're still going to have a hyper-engaged electorate that's being driven by the issues that matter to them that is represented in those ballot measures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, there, were, uh, there was a term mentioned uh, called ballot fatigue. Uh, we, I believe, did put together um, a terminology sheet, which is over there on the side. Um, and what we're calling, uh, it's called either roll-off or ballot fatigue. It's abstaining from voting in only some ballot contests, usually those lower on the ballot. So if you have an extremely long ballot, things that are way down on page five may not get voted on. Um, the data above, sh uh, we had data above on more roll-off and longer ballot in even year elections because as you know, this year we have a pretty long All right. <laughs> well, just the blue book for the state is 111 pages. Um, all right, Brooke is going to start the um, answer to the question. Yeah, I'll start and then if Sam, and then if wants, Sam wants to, to jump in and you have three in. minutes, thank you. Yeah, so this question really gets to the point of, of, this, of, of our side. So it's really definitely a question for the pro side. Like, how are you going to deal with the ballot fall off in even years? But it gets to a good point for us. Like, how do we approach the fact that we do have lower turnout in our odd year elections? And for us, our idea is really that instead of just going for the numbers and just moving our elections to even years, we should really make some substantial changes. So instead of just going for the numbers, we really want to grab voter engagement and encourage that. So instead of just, again, going for the numbers, we'd like to actually do some more outreach to voters. And we think that we can raise the, the turnout numbers by some simple steps. And Mary Young had recently written an op-ed that she published in the Daily Camera that addresses some of these potential options. So she had noted that we could provide landlords with incentives to distribute voter registration to low-income tenants. We could engage community connectors to distribute educational materials and mentor new voters, as well as print and distribute bilingual sample local ballots to make sure we're preparing voters adequately. She also suggested some potential options for local businesses they could include generic, useful voter information on receipts. They could distribute voter registration forms with paychecks, post flyers in retail store windows, and finally, nonpartisan handouts available at checkouts. 
So these are all ways just to make tangible differences to actually increase voter engagement instead of just raising the numbers. And as something that was mentioned when we talk about roll off, so even if we have the higher numbers coming out to vote, how many of them are completing their ballot all the way to the end? And what we know is that ballot fatigue is real. It's, it's covered in, in all of the literature, and we know that it'll happen in Boulder. And if you look at the handout that was provided to you by the League of Women Voters so kindly, you can see some of the ballot drop off. And if you're looking even in the even year elections, the 2020 and 2018, you're still seeing an eight point drop off in 2020, and you're seeing a five point drop off in 2018. So simply moving elections won't answer this problem, but voter engagement will, even in odd years. Thanks, Brooke. And I just, I just want to add one thing to what Brooke said. A lot of the literature that studies how to get better representation from underrepresented groups in communities says the first thing you need to look at is voter outreach. So targeted voter outreach of the specific communities you're trying to bring up in their proportional representation in voting is something which Mary's suggestions really get directly at. How do you get to the voters that you want to come who aren't voting right now? Okay, thank you. Um, this is a kind of a what if kind of an issue, but special district elections are in the process of moving from May to even years, May of even years to May of odd years. What do you think of this change and do you think it might have any other influence on elections? It's a hypothetical, I realize. We don't do special districts. Colorado does a lot of special yeah, districts. Yes, the, city, yeah. the state has a lot of special districts, like hundreds. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I'm just trying to order its context to the city of Boulder. Oh, okay. It's to election timing. Yeah, it's election timing. Okay. Yeah. How about a minute and a sure. half? Sure. This is a you hypothetical. Can, you can always use less time. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, so to sort of the, the hypothetical of, of whether there's special district elections in even years, um, I, I really don't see the issue there. I, I think at the end of the day, what we, and, and really I think what the focus should be is the, the ability to engage 20,000 more people. It comes down to the simplest of questions. Does increasing voter turnout matter? And to what was just, was just, just discussed about all those great outreach, 100%, let's do it. We should have been doing it, let's keep doing it. But we'll spend the next 50 years doing that outreach to get the same volume of voter turnout as just one ballot measure, one checkbox on the ballot. So why not yes and? Why not yes to even year and yes and to all that turnout? There's, it, does, it shouldn't be mutually exclusive. So the idea with special districts, I don't think, again, will impact the city of Boulder because we don't engage upon that. And so for the most part, our ballot will not really be impacted by that, more or less. Now, I could see that other communities may want to move to even year and let them make those decisions. But for us, I think we should be very comfortable in being able to move to even year and not worry too much about those fatigue or, or drop-off issues because at the end of the day, engaging 20,000 more people is the single biggest impactful thing we can do to engage the electorate. There's no other, all this outreach, we're talking a few dozen, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand if you're lucky. 20,000 people, that's enough to fill the ball arena in Denver and we can immediately engage that electorate instantly. Thank you, Matt. And now I think Sam's going to. I will, I'm just gonna get a share up here real quick so I can speak to it briefly. Can you make it bigger? Can you do that? I can't, but I'll talk to you. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I didn't want to share the slide. It's shared. Oh, no, no, I didn't do the presentation. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you for that. So I believe the point of the question was really about special district elections, like fire district elections, moving from May of odd years to November of odd years. That's similar to what Jersey City did in New Jersey. For some reason, folks think that Jersey City moved their 
local elections from e odd years to even years, they did not do that. Their last vote was in an odd year, but they moved their May elections to November, and that's seen universally as a good thing because elections in the spring have much worse ballot fall off. Like you might have 20% of your registered voters. So many places are focusing on that big move, which is to move into November so that they overlap. As far as the effect I think it would have here, I think it would be better for both current city council and school district elections if those special district elections were held in those odd years. So they're local, which is when um, odd year elections should have local issues. And I think it would bring out a few more voters who would then vote in city council races if they were part of city council. Um, special district elections, I don't know for sure, but I assume if the library district becomes a district, that would be one of the folks that would do any ballot measure, uh, sorry, any revenue increases or so on, would then be done in uh, November. I believe some special districts can choose November, and I don't know if the question specifies whether they don't have to be. I just have to that it would be moving from most, many special elections are in special districts are in the springs. Yes, in May indeed. Or June. Indeed. And uh, now it's in even years and they're asking if we're moving it to odd years, which as you say is when many local elections are instead of statewide elections. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna rephrase this question because I, I do think it's a good one. Um, Matt had brought up uh, about uh, the disempowerment of minorities. And um, I was wondering, Matt, if you could just explain a little bit more about that and then have um, Brooke or Sam uh, continue on with their side. How do you address the disempowerment of minorities um, in elections? Uh, two minutes. Thank you for the, the question. I, I would actually argue that this is one of the most fundamental questions for our community. Our, our community is over 90% white. We are desperately doing everything we can to proportionately increase the involvement, the interaction, and how people of color participate in our community. It is one of the most foundational things we're doing currently on council, and when Sam was on council, they started that process too. Yet we're just not getting it done. And one of the areas which we see it very obviously not working is when it comes to our elections. Why aren't our boards, commissions, and our city council more reflective of a greater diversity in our community? This graph kind of elicits one of the main reasons for that. So when you look at some of these precincts that have a large fraction of non-white residents, you see the voter drop off dramatically increase. The, 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 the gap between where they vote in even years and where they vote in odd years is far greater in those precincts than in precincts that have a higher fraction of white people per capita in that precinct. And so at the end of the day, this is about engagement, which I would love to see those great ideas of engagement, but first, let's go to where people are in time. We try to go to them in space and say, let's give you a ballot. Let's put ballot drop boxes near you. We do all those things to go to where they physically are. What we haven't done is go to where they are in time. And where they are in time is participating in our electoral process on even years. We don't lose in that, end, in that aspect. And I'll just sort of point out, um, with regards to Boulder Valley School District, there's a number of um, uh, school districts as well as state representatives that are currently working on legislation to give school districts the right to choose and have local control as to when they hold their elections. This would help perhaps nudge them in the direction to give them that authority to even here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and is it Sam or Brooke who will address this? Brooke will. Okay. Thank you on disparities or disempowerment. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like musical chairs up there doing this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so we've seen the charts that have been presented by the people for voter turnout several times now. And what we really need to emphasize here is that Boulder County does not track 
voter outcomes based on demographics, especially not race or ethnicity. So we can't know any of this for sure. And especially when we look at the comparison of the whitest district along to what is claimed to be the most diverse district to each other, we're not accounting for any other demographics in there. So that was one of the slides that was shown earlier. And since we can't track, since we don't track in Boulder County, the actual ethnic and racial breakdown in the voter outcomes, we have to speculate based on what's happening in other parts of the country. And in, in answer to looking at how would this more empower racially diverse voters, we have to ask, would it actually change the share of representation in the overall voting population? And if we look outside of Boulder County and we look at California, when they analyze cities that have similar demographics to Boulder, so about 80% white, what they find is very little shift in the actual representation when you move elections from odd to even years. They find that the white share of votes decreases by about 5%, and in their analysis, the Latino vote increases by less than 5%. We did a back of the envelope calculation looking at Boulder using the same sort of speculative analysis of the different districts. And what we found is if you take into account the largest and most diverse area, the CU student population, we see the same thing. We see very little shift in voter share. And so we agree with Matt and with people for voter turnout, we really need more engagement to create a more engaged electorate, not just to switch in elections. Thank you very much. Um, you say if one of the drivers to move this forward, uh, the, if it to be passed, uh, is a matter of engaging or increasing voters and people of color, why not looking in? Why not look into investing in the time and resources to increase candidates who are representative of those communities? Um, and why don't you guys start this time and we'll give you two minutes. Okay. okay. So, because of this issue, I've been studying with a lot of folks all that we can find about this, and there's um, several places that we've really looked, and I think the one that I find the most interesting is there's a Stanford um, Sociology Research Institute and if you look at the papers that they've collected about how you engage voters better and how you specifically look at things like better Latino and black representation in voting groups, it, it says there's structural shifts you can make. You should reduce all barriers at the ballot box. So things that we've done like motor voter laws and being able to register up to the day of the election and having mail ballots out to everybody and vote by mail, those are the first things they recommend. So we ticked off all the first things they recommend. And when they come down to things like shifting from odd year local elections to even year elections, they do produce the results that Brooke told you about. And so for more white communities, it has less impact for representativeness, which means proportional representation. And they all recommend that even if you try structural changes, like all the ones I just described, that targeted voter outreach and helping communities get into the habit of voting is the most important thing you can do. And so the ideas that Mary Young found from reading those research studies about how you actually bring up the proportion of Hispanic voters and increase the proportion of black voters all comes down to targeted outreach. Matt's right, we should have been doing this in the past. I don't recall hearing the city talk about doing things like that ever in my time on council, but it is something that if a good comes out of this, which is not a very well put together idea, but if this conversation stimulates us to do the outreach that is shown to be much more effective than these small structural changes, then I think that's where we should put our time and energy going forward. Thank you very much. The turnout figure. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. It's not a debate, but we have equal it's time. Not a, you have equal time. Go ahead. You have. It's all good. 
there's, there, I mean, there, at the end of the day with this question, there's not too much to generally disagree with. Like, engagement is great. Outreach is great. Again, I come back to yes and. Why not engage, do that engagement when you've got 20,000 more people at the ready to vote? We know these folks, with regards to some of that racial disparity, we know these folks vote, vote on local issues. We see it. 20,000 more people. And we see where those ballots come in from. We know that there's engagement there. And, and really, one of the best ways in which we can do this, and, and we, I wonder if this isn't what the issue is, but we started to do this with Our Mayor, Our Choice in 2020, is the structural problem isn't just when we're voting, it's the voting system we're using. And so at the end of the day, what I'd like to see us do is like we're doing with Mayor to do instant runoff ranked choice voting, move our council elections to single transferable vote ranked choice voting proportional representation. That, in the structural way in which we vote, the mechanics of it, is actually how we will get that proportional representation we seek. And so part of the reason why those communities that Sam brought up were not seeing the, quite that, that increase like they wanted to in, in representation is because the first past the post voting system intrinsically dilutes and diminishes the minority voice in that capacity. So it's only well-organized groups that are able to actually succeed in winning. And so well-organized groups in our current democracy in this country are intrinsically dominated by white people. So therefore, those outcomes are self-evident. And so at the end of the day, if we increase voter turnout and we then move to change our election system, we will have transfer transformational change in our community where we will have proportional representation, where we will be hearing from a real majority of our community with over 50,000 people expressing their preference and their will for who they want to represent them on city council. Thank you. Now I think I've got the order straight in my head. I apologize. <laughs> um, I should change my little routine here. Um, I keep everyone on their toes. I know, including myself here. Um, Okay, if it's all about turnout, why not try compulsory voting? That would guarantee representativeness of the electorate and would ensure all barriers to voting would be eliminated. I got the first chuckle from Sam, so I'm going to start with him, and this time I'll remember Matt follows him. And why don't we do uh, two minutes? So I don't think compulsory voting is going to go for great in America. <laughs> That's just my first reaction to that. I think, you know, largely the way that things work here is more incentive-based. And so I think if, if I were really going to look at how we get more people out to vote, I'd start with things like making sure that employers gave people the day off, shifting the day of the election to sometime on a weekend, or making it a national holiday, which is what a lot of the countries do. Australia, I believe, has compulsory voting, and I think they've had some, no? Federal and state are compulsory, okay. So, um, so more or less, I think compulsory voting is probably a dead letter, but I think the idea of incentivizing people to vote has a lot of merit to it. Um, I, I also think it's probably worth um, kind of taking up again the discussion about what will happen if all of these 20,000 new voters come out. A big chunk of them aren't going to vote the whole ballot. I mean, we've got the number, we can see what that looks like. In presidential election year, there are places where they've reported 20 and 30 percent fall off on presidential ballots. They'll look at a mayoral race or a council race down ballot in a presidential year, and they find huge ballot drop off from the people who vote for president, the first line item on the ballot, all the way down to the local elections, which in our case would be starting at line 41. This year would be our local races. Um, so uh, it, it seems to me like <clears throat> if our goal is representativeness and structural changes won't get us there, we come right back to the same thing the academics all say. It has to be targeted outreach. And I will say this about 2E, even if we decided this should be done, it should be part of a package of election reforms. Doing these things piecemeal and leaving BBSD out is a total fail. 
Thank you so much. And now I will go back to Matt. His response. Well, really, with regards to compulsory voting, I, I mean, Sam said it, so I don't know if I need to repeat what he said. I, I think that's kind of dead on arrival, um, and those incentives are absolutely there. Um, you know, when you think about down down ballot, absolutely, right? We we know that ninety percent of older voters turned out in twenty twenty, and when they worked down ballot, you know that that's some eighty six, I believe, eighty six thousand voters that are that are voting, and I think that's roughly about right, somewhere in the high eighties. And when you got down to the local ballot measures, armor our choice, no eviction without representation, bedrooms are for people, we were still getting 50 to 54, 55,000 people. So what's crazy is we're going to complain about the drop-off and say, well, the drop-off, that's still 20,000 more people than we're currently getting in our odd-year elections. So, so let's be clear. I mean, we're currently only seeing our high water marks of 33, 34,000 people in an odd year election vote for council, and yet we can almost double that number by a ballot measure. So it's important, and when we say why go for the numbers, well, you know, it's a distraction. It's really a distraction. Why go for the numbers? Well, because that's where it starts. We've done that. We've had, we have done the other work, the work with ballot boxes, the work with mailing in ballots. We've done that. Now we have to meet people where they are, which is voting an even year. And I think if we really do that, we can be a yes and. 20,000 more people are voting, and we engage the electorate, the ways in which have been discussed, which I fully support. And yes and will build an incredibly well-represented community of voters. And if we certainly make those structural changes to move and change the actual voting system we have, Boulder will be at the top of a game that no one has yet to conquer with regards to how we elect people for our democratic processes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is, the turnout figures you show are presumably the percentage of registered voters. Um, do you think that TUI would impact or increase the percentage of eligible voters who choose to register to vote? Who would like to start? Oh, I see a finger being pointed at Matt to start first. How about a minute and a half? I know it's a good hypothetical. That's a good That's question. A good All right, I'll read it back and make sure I've got it. Sure. So I want to make sure I have this question correct. It's really is if, if passing 2E would increase voter registration. Yeah, in, in the odd year or in the even year. In the even year. Yeah. Do you think that more people would register? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't answer that question necessarily. I think voter registration is more largely impacted by things like purging voter rolls and wanting to you know, give up your voter information that, that we've seen at the national level. I mean, we've seen our spikes in voter registration go up and down far more because of those issues or open primaries in which people get to change their affiliation. I mean, th those larger structural things will change the tide of voter registration uh, more so. What, what may actually help do this, in, 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 and again, may increase some of the voter registration, is actually with regards to understanding when people um, in our community, 52% of our community rents, and a lot of people are changing their address, maybe from year to year. So when they think they're registered to vote, they're not. Now they can get by with same-day registration, but if they don't do that, they could be left out. Um, so there are ways in which I think that could increase voter registration if they're getting the information about register to vote. Keep in mind, the get out to vote, the GOTV work that's done in even years is, is immense, right? We're talking billions of dollars spent to get people to turn out to vote. And so if you're an even year and you're maybe on the fence or don't know about your registration status, you're getting bombarded by the state and federal elections trying to engage you as a voter. And that might get you to change, oh, I need to vote and, and, and be registered. On an odd year, you're not getting that impact. And so you might not be registered in an odd year election, whereas even year you'll get that uh, GOTV and be encouraged to vote and register. Thank you. 
Thank you, Matt. Um, and I think Brooke has won the uh, selection to answer this. Thank you. This hypothetical. I like this hypothetical. Uh, it's very interesting. So I would speculate that no, you're probably not going to increase voter registration. And it's really because you're not doing anything but moving an election. So you won't have your odd year elections anymore, but you're just moving it to an even year where people are already familiar with what they're going to be voting on as far as state and national elections. So there's no incentive to increase voter enrollment through that move. But it does get back kind of to the question of engagement again. So if we want to increase our voter roles, we need improved engagement. And going back to what Matt had said about you know, the, the question of numbers versus engagement as a distraction, I have to disagree. It's not a distraction. We know that with the studies of ballot fatigue, that as ballots get longer, as we're presented with more choices that we have to make, voters actually tend to become less engaged. They tend to learn less about the candidates they tend to learn less about the issues, and then you tend to get an increase in what I had discussed before, you get the increase in the randomness of voting and other things of that nature. And so if we're decreasing our engagement, and we're also, as I had mentioned before, we're not probably not going to increase the actual voter share of different populations that are voting, there's no reason why we should expect to see any more diversity in our boards, in our commissions, or on our city council with this move either. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's... Thank you very much. Um, the next question um, is, why should we put nonpartisan candidate elections on the ballot with partisan candidate elections? And. Um, Sam's smiling, so he's going to start, and why don't we give it um, two minutes. <laughs> Where's that poker face? <laughs> I'll start Actually, with the Sam is a poker face, but... Uh, <laughs> you shouldn't mix them together, I think, is the answer. I think nonpartisan local elections are that way for a reason, because in the old days, the national parties controlled the cities and they did that through machines and mostly it was you know democratic or republican depending on where you were but a lot of the work back in the early part of the last century was to break that to break that connection and it happened in two ways first it was to make sure that the elections for local offices were held in different years and then the other was to make sure they were nonpartisan. i think the desire to shift to nonpartisan came first because there was the whole issue of the party machines and there was a time i can still remember when my parents went in to vote when there'd be an r lever and a d lever and if you turn them it just voted the whole ticket for you and so from a national party perspective you would like to see things move to even years because it would give local parties more <clears throat> control and i will note that a lot of the folks who in the Democratic Party who are supporting more aggressive local Democratic positions, I'm a 30 year Democrat, been one in Boulder County as long as I've lived here, but the, the idea is to try and get more and more attention to local issues, which I think is very distracting. So it, moving local nonpartisan elections into partisan years is a bad idea for a lot of reasons. I think it's bad for the parties. I think it's bad for the candidates, I think it's bad for the voters and donors and volunteers. So I can't come up with a good reason to do it except 20,000 more voters, but if those 20,000 more voters aren't increasing really representation in a way that we can measure, then it's really speculative what you've done. So I guess my answer to the question is you shouldn't mix them, you should leave local elections in odd years and work to get more people voting in them. And for me, I'd love to see county commissioner races in odd years as well. Thank you very much. Matt? Uh, thanks for, for the question. Uh, the last part that Sam said means we're going backwards, right? If we want to now move county commissioners to <laughs> low voter turnout years, uh, we are uh, further moving away from a truly representative democracy and actually engaging the electorate as a whole. Um, you know, one of the issues with regards to why nonpartisan mixed with partisan, well, well, first off, the parties are not endorsing, none of us run with D's and R's. They're, they're, they're worried, of, they're, they endorse ballot measures, but they're not picking or, or deciding who candidates are that are running. 
They're not holding candidate forums. They're staying effectively out of the candidate side of already our elections. And, and that's, that's by statute, they, they can't. They're, they're not allowed to participate. Um, and, and really to the question of partisan versus non, look what we're doing right now. It is a gubernatorial even year election. And what, we're, what are we doing? We're spending the evening talking about a local issue. Local politics dominate our community. Are we having large community debates on whether, whether a majority of Boulder is going to be supporting Governor Polis or Heidi Grandall? No. Are we having large community debates about whether Jonah Goose should continue to be our congressman? No. Those things are for us, we know the answer. We're not spending a lot of time on that because we know and have shared values throughout our community from which we understand who our elected officials should be. So what we're doing is we're spending the time on local stuff right now. That's what we're doing. So to think that somehow this idea of mixing partisan versus nonpartisan, to me again, is another distraction. There was just a debate at the JCC, and Sam did a great job at that debate with regards to CU South. We're talking about local elections. So why would that change if we just added council candidates to an even year? In fact, it would engage and further enrich that conversation. And, more, um, and there's the time. So I, yeah, I don't see that as an issue. I, I lean the other direction. Let's mix them together because of the great impact we can have in our communities. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, um, and, and just I know we've gotten several questions about um, how to interpret um, our terminology. I think I'd rather have people talk to um, either the league members or uh, the representatives up here to interpret uh, the, uh, the terminology rather than going into a weighty potential discussion uh, to understand all the terminology. So um, I have not been trying to blow you off with <laughs> questions. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, you get the time that you need so that you can understand because this is, in some cases, sort of a technical understanding. Um, I hope you're all good at mathematics. That's why mathematicians love this topic. And um, so uh, I will go to my next question. The Boulder Reporting Lab analyzed the first major ballot measures committee financial filings and donations were about half of last year. Do you believe candidates from underrepresented communities without wide backing will be able to find the funds uh, to run a campaign in even years, and this has been touched on, um, you know, previously that it would be an impact uh, on a candidate uh, who would normally run in an odd year to be able to run in a full year. So maybe to expand on that, do you want to start with that one, uh, Matt? Did you repeat that question? Sure. It is. It's true. It's both sides of the. <laughs> Um, okay, it basically boils down to, do you believe candidates from, let's say, underrepresented communities would, uh, without wide backing, will be able to find the funds to run a campaign in even years? And, you know, we've had some, we've had some pretty heavy ballots um, in Boulder uh, in the last few years, so um, how would this affect them, or not affect them? Thank and uh, two minutes. Okay. Well, so I'll, I'll, I mean that, that question is an important one, and I will say that you'll get to my answer, but I'll preface it with credit for why this might be less of an issue goes back to our immensely successful campaign finance laws. No candidate can receive more than a hundred dollars period. You need roughly like 83 people to contribute at that amount to reach matching funds. You right now reach about $11,000 in contributions and the city matches another 11000 or so and you get to a, a rolling cap that adjusts for inflation last year was about $23,000. We have a very low barrier of entry because of that, that big money does not own candidate elections because of those campaign finance rules. And so we have a very strong, low barrier of entry for that. And so, yeah, really to the question, can candidates from underserved, underserved communities you know, gain backing? 
Well, yeah, it comes down to values. It comes down to what your values are at issues. And I think um, they absolutely can. But the problem is, is, as we've seen with some of the voter data, that if you're coming from an underserved community, the numbers are showing that those communities are not voting in odd years. And so your base, of elect your base electorate is already generally not participating. So that becomes a challenge of how are you going to reach that base. So it comes down to ultimately if we want underserved people to have a great chance to have greater equity in our elections, it's changing our actual election system to a proportional representation, single transferable vote. I'll say that really fast to meet the time. But at the end of the day, those are the core pieces there. So at the end of the day, I think our campaign finance laws are great. And we've seen people, not everyone reach the max. And when groups support you, um, you get a little help from that capacity as well. So I think there's a lot to be said about the structure we have. Uh, but there's some work that we can do to improve that for sure. Thank you. And I think Brooke is going to handle it. Yes. The other side. This is a great question, and it gets to one of the initial points that Sam had pointed out in his intro, and that is, is that when we force candidates to compete, so when we force our city council candidates to compete with national and state candidates, we're absolutely going to dilute funding resources. So, so Matt's correct. You know, every individual can only give a hundred dollars to a to a candidate, but you can give a lot more money to state and national candidates. And so if you have limited funds and you are looking at something that could potentially affect women's health rights or immigration, you're more likely to throw your $100 at that as opposed to a city council election. Also, I don't think this is really specific to minority or underrepresented candidates. I think this is across the board. It will happen to all of our city council candidates. They'll all be fighting for, for reduced funding pools when they're competing in even year elections. And that's if they can even draw attention to themselves in the first place with that. Uh, also, let's see. We already have shown, too, that we're not, by moving elections to even years, we're not necessarily increasing the share of voters. So if you're going to base this on the fact that we think, that we think in Boulder County, the fewer minorities are voting in odd years, moving them to, to even years is not going to increase their share. They're still going to be on a percentage basis at a disadvantage based on other cities that we've looked at with similar demographics too. Uh, and this also could have a big impact on direct democracy because when we move to even year elections, if there is a ballot measure from an underrepresented group, they will struggle to get the increased number of signatures that are going to be required now to get something onto the ballot. So all around, it's not a good deal, underrepresented or not. Thank you very much. Um, I know this has been touched upon, but maybe you could expand on it a little bit more. In, um, if, if 2E would pass, how many people do you would you expect would vote in the Boulder Valley School District measures? Oh, it fails. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Let me, let me regroup here. This is a confusing question for me. Um, forget that question. I don't know. Can I do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could, but I'm not sure it'd be popular. That's why you're the moderator. Um, okay, how many of those 20,000 more even year voters will lose the habit of voting because they are not voting in odd years? And how many people do you predict will vote in odd years if 2E passes? So, Sam's going to go first, and um, do you want to do two and a half minutes? Because it could be two minutes is good. Two minutes is good, and then Matt goes. So, I think we can all agree that it's extremely unlikely that if we pass this measure, move city council elections to even years, that we're going to see an increase in odd year elections. I'm not sure what would create that. And so I think what is far more likely 
is that if you move, say, half of the reason that people vote in odd years, we say for candidates, half vote for council and half vote for school district, and you move half of those races over into the very crowded even years, then I think you're definitely going to see drop off. And what that will do is several things. It will, of course, negatively impact Boulder Valley School District elections, but it will also mean that folks who are looking to get something on that will uh, ballot measure on that would benefit from lower turnout for whatever reason, they would target those at odd years because there's nothing about this move of council elections to even years that says we're going to stop holding odd year elections. The state makes us hold them for Boulder Valley School District, which they will now have to pay for all themselves, by the way. And also ballot items, ballot initiatives will be on those odd year elections. So I think we'll see fall off. I think we'll see, you know, people pushing to do, I would say, shenanigans with Boulder Valley School District and also trying to be strategic about placing less popular ballot items in odd years when they'll get less attention. So I think actually this is really bad for odd years. I do also want to address one thing that was said. <clears throat> There's this idea that we in Boulder County know who we're voting for. We're all Democrats. We all know we're voting for Joe Goose. We're voting for Jared Polis for governor. But as this slide shows, it's not all President, Governor, Senate, Congress. You know, Colorado, Secretary of State, Treasurer, Attorney General, Board of Education, Regents, like these are substantial races that both need money and attention and they're candidate races and there's not everybody that knows who they're voting for and there's no button that just marks the D on your ballot. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. So, you know, will adding 20,000 people to even your elections, um, will they lose interest in odd year? You know, again, what's driving the interest in our local elections? It's the issues. If there are just sort of blah issues, then you're not going to get a lot of people excited to vote, independent of where council is. We see that. Now, if it's an odd year and you've got some exciting ballot measures that are engaging deep with people's values or having wide range community impact, you're going to drive voter turnout. You're going to drive engagement on those issues. And that's going to not see terrible drop off or fatigue with regards to odd years. So again, it's the issues that are driving in this community. We go back time and time again. And I mean, Sam, we can go back years and look at elections. They weren't defined by a candidate. We'll go back and think about what was 2015, like, ah, oh, 300, 301, it was an issue. You go back to 2017, yeah, that was the Muni. It's the issue that, that is the hallmarks of these, of these odd year elections. And it will continue to be so. So I, I'm not too concerned about that. And you know, these 33,000 voters that vote in odd year elections are already highly motivated, highly dedicated, and will almost certainly turn out all the time, turn out every year, every year. And, and there's a good chance by engaging people in those local issues with council candidates and staying engaged on even years with 20,000 more people, we might actually start to see a trickle down where they're starting to engage more in the local process and might actually find reason to participate in those odd years as well. Once you hook people into that democratic process and they get a feedback loop of, oh, engagement, oh, I've got someone that's going to advocate for me and they feel good about the vote that then reflects back on their lives, they're gonna stay engaged. That's a classic feedback loop. And so I think that there's an opportunity that it actually maintain, or if not, perhaps increase voter turnout in some capacities. But it comes down to the issues. Thank you very much. Um, we're sort of running towards the end of the evening, and um, this is a totally hypothetical. You can throw, yeah, another Nerf ball at it. Um, do you have an opinion uh, that towns like Erie and Nederland should move their elections from April to November? Would this impact you or not so? If so, how could that change happen for them? What about larger cities? Well, larger cities. Let's just stick local here in Boulder County. Do you have any opinions? You want to throw a Nerf ball at it? How about a minute? Oh, okay. Matt's going. Um, so 
Yeah, should Hiri and, and some of our other sister cities move their elections? You know, um, I, I, at the end of the day, I leave that to our friends and our sister communities to make that decision for themselves. That's not really for us in Boulder to decide. I do think that there's an issue of hubris that Boulder is sort of the, the gorilla and gets to sort of dictate the terms for everybody else. Um, so, so that's not the case. I, I, should they? Is there value of moving and aligning where everyone else knows when it's time to vote? Absolutely. Like we've talked about those special districts. And so yes, if, you, if it's moving from spring to that November to engage and be consistent and not spread the resources of voter engagement and not be making decisions on the smallest fraction of voters voting, yeah, it's probably a good thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that that's a decision for those communities to make uh, for themselves. And um, if we can show that that even year is working and that it's viable, then maybe they will decide that that's something they want to do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess Brooke gets to answer this one. Thank you. I have to agree with Matt on this one as far as it's up to them if they want to move it or not. But it does kind of go back to a point that was presented earlier and that we don't want to leave it up to an issue being cool enough to, to draw the voters out. So if, if it's a cool issue, does that mean that we should neglect something because it just happens to be not so cool and it's going to be voted on in odd years or in April versus November? No, we want to have voters coming out at all of the times. And this hits on the point of ballot fatigue as well. So if something's not of interest and you have a long ballot and you're going through, you're less likely to to think about the issue and you're more likely to vote randomly. You're also more likely to make voting errors in that situation as well too. Uh, so if they would like to move their elections, sure, that's great. But uh, yes, it's definitely something that's up to them. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, it's a little bit early, but I think um, we've got a lot of other information that we would like to share with you. Um, I would like to um, have a wrap up starting. And um, we are going, I'm going to start with um, Sam um, to do a two and a half minute wrap up of why people uh, should oppose to eat. So I think my position here is pretty clear. I think you should oppose it because it distracts voters from, it, it divides their attention. So in a given year, you have a certain amount of attention. Most people who aren't political animals, like all of us, are going to get their ballot in the mail, and they're going to throw it in the table with their voter guide, and they're going to sit down at some point, and they're going to try and fit it into their day or their weekend, and they're going to try and fit it in. And so just arbitrarily lengthening the ballot, it's obviously going to have downsides, and that's a problem. But I'm going to focus on what I wrote my editorial about recently, which is this just hasn't been through the community process to figure out what the best thing that we could do generally would be. If this were run in a way that council kind of set the rules for itself, this would be an 18 month engagement process and we could talk about not just voter outreach and not just shifting to even years, but we could talk about how do we want to do ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting for a single seat election is kind of silly because 99 times out of 100, the ranked choice vote and the winner take all are the same because you got one seat and often two or three candidates. What I think is far more interesting to talk about is single transferable vote for council seats. So multi-candidate, multi-seat elections. That would be a great conversation to have and then we could throw in all of these other things about outreach and timing, but this isn't there yet. It's just not thought through well enough. It takes one element out of one thing that 6% of cities do in the country which is have even your local elections. So it's not popular. It's not widespread. Some of the cities that have done this have just done it. I have examples of cities where they've said no. So there are places in the community, in the country that have gone backwards on this. They've gone the other direction. High Point, North Carolina shifted for a few years, didn't like it, and then shifted back. Tucson rejected it 58 to 42 in 2018 when they had the chance to do it. If you're gonna do something like this, it's a big deal. It's our election system. We should hear from people. One public hearing on this 
there's no justification for it except the measures so simple anybody can understand more is better i think it's more complex than that particularly with the bbdsd issue so this isn't ready at the very least even if it should happen it should be coupled with a bunch of other things and this is premature and not completely made thank you that's sam weaver from save local elections and um matt benjamin will for the people for voter turnout we'll have two and a half minutes Making things more complex than they need to be is how we sow confusion. Come back to Occam's razor. The best solution is often the simplest. We are in a we are in an internal, not existential, an internal crisis in this country with regards to democracy. We are watching democracy get beat down and stripped away across the country. Now, thankfully, we're not necessarily seeing that here, but we have some underlying foundational issues that could use shoring up. And so isn't it time that we do that? You know, the idea that there hasn't been a process, well, because it's a simple question. Do you value more voters voting? I mean, it, it, it's simple. So we could spend 18 months telling you what you already know, that 20,000 more people vote in even years than not, we could, we could spend 18 months talking about who else has done it. We know who else has done it. We could spend 18 months doing all this other stuff, but at the end they were asking a very simple question to a very educated electorate. Boulder voters are engaged, they're educated. We trust the outcomes of voters in this community on every issue. And the idea that there could be fatigue or drop off or voting errors or all those things when you have long ballots then do we question the results of the local ballot measures that are at the bottom of those even year elections? Do we question that? Do we say, well, it's diluted. Well, there's probably more errors. No, we take that and we respect the will of the people because we trust our voters in this community. And yes, single transferable vote is absolutely where we should go, but we don't have the authority to do it. It requires state action. We could do it, we could pass something, but it requires state legislative action and guidance from the Secretary of State's office for us to implement that, which we could happen, but that'll take some time. So at the end of the day, these are communities like LA, and they show the results of the increase in voter turnout. It's yes and. Increase voter turnout, have 20,000 more people vote, and do all that outreach, but they are not mutually exclusive. You don't just do the outreach and say, well, be damned with those 20,000 voters. We can have our cake and eat it. We just have to say yes on 2E. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody in the panel for participating and for your thoughtfulness on the questions. Uh, apologize for my Um Anyway, I did want to talk about some of the other events that the uh, league is going to be having. We do have um, several virtual uh, meetings on ballot issues. On uh, October the 9th, from two to three, they're going, we're going to be doing Longmont, Erie, and Superior ballot issues. On October 9th at 3.30, we're going to be doing the City of Boulder um, ballot issues. And on October the 16th at three o'clock, we're going to be doing state, county, and BBSD school district ones. These will be virtual. It'll be, you can go to vote411.org. Um, and can we also go to the league website at lwbc.org? And you will be able to track down and get those um, invitations. Because 2E isn't the only one on the ballot in Boulder <laughs> this year. That's not some good ones. Um, Forty of them. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of ballot issues this year, folks. But um, on behalf of the league, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the community conversation. 
Um, we appreciate the campaign representatives for sharing their perspectives and answering questions uh, from the people who are gathered here this evening. And thank you to our event organizers, including Celeste Landry, who was also our timekeeper, along with Arthur Lee, Laura Coates, who was doing video, um, Elizabeth Black, who is marvelous and moving around the room with our question cards, um, Neil Burnett was around, and then our operations coordinator, Anna Lamarck. Um, we want to thank also the League of Women Voters election season sponsors, whose contrib contributions enable bilingual candidate forums, ballot issue presentations, voter outreach, and our vote411.org election information platform. Our sponsors include Elevation Credit Union, High Plains Bank, Christine's, Big F Restaurant Group, Joanne Silverstein, and other generous donors. We appreciate your contributions to make sure Boulder County have access to accurate, trustworthy, nonpartisan election information. Finally, thank you to all of the community conversation participants. It's up to all of us to make sure we respect and work to protect our democratic process. Too many people have suffered and succeeded in the struggle to win these rights for us not to use them. It starts with being an informed and active voter and contributing to policy dialogue and decisions. Um, anyway, the League of Women Voters of Boulder County works throughout the year to help empower voters and defend democracy. If you want to lend your time and your skills to encourage civic engagement of all people in a nonpartisan manner, please join us. All the information you need for the 2022 election season is at www.lwdbc.org. Thank you and have a great evening.